you're new or visiting, my name is Roy. Welcome to Engadine Congregational Church. Thank you to everyone for praying for me. It's so good to be on my feet and alive, <laughs> which I couldn't say that was true last, last week. I was alive, barely, but it's good to be out and about. Well, if you haven't already done so, may I please invite you to turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of John. Page 1038 in the Pew Bibles, we'll be considering that passage that was, that was read for us by Steve earlier. But before I do that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that the true light that gives light to every man has come into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was our own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Children born not out of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. Lord, I pray that you will grant the new birth to those who do not yet know you this morning. And for those who have been born again, that you would encourage us with your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you may have recognized that there is a, a visible emptiness in this stage. There was a piano here last week, and it was moved uh, last Friday by a couple of very strong, very capable men. And as I was doing what I usually do, supervising, um, we had a good chat because um, apparently they were from Brazil, they were Catholics, and when I greeted them out in the front, they were like, are you the priest of this church? And I said, um, not quite, I am the, the pastor of this church. Oh, so it's a Protestant church. Like, yes, it's a Protestant church. Oh, good, so that means you can get married. Uh, I was like, yes, it's one of the benefits of being in a Protestant church. You can get married, you can have kids, and I'm really grateful for that. And more seriously, the guy who I was talking with specifically said, it must be really hard being a, a pastor, isn't it? I was like, what do you mean? Well, you know, not many people believe in Jesus. Not many people are open to hearing things about the Bible. I was like, you could say that. You could say that, that people are not as open to hearing about the Bible and hearing about Jesus. But then I thought to myself, what's changed? <laughs> Like it's always, there's always been division. There has always been a sense of hesitation, a bit of reluctance towards the things of God, and we've seen that in the Gospel of John. And I think one of the temptations that we face when we go out into the world and we try and live out Christian lives and we try to share the Gospel, share the hope that is found in Jesus to those around us, is that because we are expecting a sort of hesitation, a sort of division, you could call it, to the things of God, we're tempted to either remain silent about our faith, so we kind of live incognito lives, not really telling anyone, we just maybe hoping that they'll pick up a scent that we're Christians, or maybe the other temptation would be to try and soften the message of the gospel. We soften certain aspects of it that we, so we try and make it more palatable so everyone can hear it, so everyone will accept it. In the face of so much division, we love to remind ourselves the words of Jesus when he taught on that mountain, blessed are the peacemakers. But what do we do when you read Jesus words such as in the gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 10 verses 34 to 36 where he says this, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Or how about in the Gospel of Luke? Luke chapter 12, verse 51. Do you think... I came to bring peace on earth, no, I tell you, but division. How do you reconcile the, the peace making Jesus and the Jesus who divides? Now, if there's one thing that is a, 
that is a common experience for all who have attempted to share the gospel of Jesus with others is that it often, oftentimes, results in a divided opinion about who Jesus is. And sometimes leading after that is divided, a divided relationship between those who hold to who Jesus claimed to be and those who do not. Especially in today's volatile culture, the exclusive claims of Jesus that I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man comes to the Father except through me, and the seeming judgmental nature of Jesus' message of repent and believe, it's not the most politically correct message. Now granted, there will be those who will accept the gospel, they will believe it, but more often than not, there will be those who are unsure about what to think about Jesus, there will be those who will be perhaps impressed by Jesus and yet never believe him in, in him entirely, and then there will be those who will outrightly deny and reject him. And I think that I can say that that is a common experience for those of us who have heralded the gospel and shared the gospel with others. So what is it that causes so much division about Jesus? What is it about Jesus that is like driving a sword between the, the closest family unit, mother, father, husband, wife, daughter, son, all of those things. What is it about Jesus that causes so much division? Well, that's really interesting when we think about that question is what had just taken place in the Gospel of John. So Steve read for us from verse 37, which we looked at two weeks ago on the last and the greatest day of the feast. After all the celebrations, after all the, the, the rituals and the festivities of the water-pouring ceremonies and the, the leaf-wavings, Jesus, in this solemn assembly, he stands up and he cries out. What does he say? If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. In other words, if you're feeling desperate, if you're feeling worn out by your cares of life, if you're feeling desperate, guilty because of the sin, and you know you have, you have sinned against God, and you need his forgiveness, and there is nothing that you can do to satisfy and to calm that angst in your soul, come to me, come to me. If you're feeling that, come to me, no prerequisite, you don't have to clean up your act. You don't need to clean up your life. Just, just come to me with all your worries, your cares, your sin, and I will quench your thirst. But not only that, I will fill you with my spirit, with such an abundance that those around you can't help but get wet. People will see the grace of God in your life, and the grace of God will flow from within you. And others will see and glorify your Father who is in heaven. You would think that that is the best news ever. But here we'll see several surprising responses to Jesus and the greatest invitation that had ever been given. We're going to see responses from the crowd. We're going to see a response from the, those within the religious institution and finally from the religious leaders themselves. So let's have a look, verse 37 to 43, we'll see, sorry, from verse 40 to 43, we'll see a division between the crowd. On hearing his words, some of the people said, surely this man is the prophet. Others said, he is the Christ. So others asked, how can the Christ come from Galilee? Does not the scripture say that the Christ will come from David's family and, and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Here we see three groups of people in this crowd, and as soon as they hear Jesus' words, a division forms between each and every one of them. This word division is where we get the word schism. There was like a schism that developed between these types of people. Firstly, there were those who believed that he was the promised prophet, and this wasn't the first time that they thought Jesus was this prophet. Do you remember back in chapter six, after Jesus multiplied the bread and fish to feed the thousands, people thought that he was this prophet. And here again, they thought that Jesus was this prophet. But that was all they thought Jesus was, a, a great prophet, this 
prophesied prophet who, who has the ability to give bread, to feed physically. Here was this other Moses, maybe even a greater Moses, but he was just a prophet. Secondly, there were those who thought that Jesus was the Christ. Now, this word Christ can also be translated as Messiah. Now, there were divided opinions as to who this Messiah was. Was this the actual Messiah who would save the world? Or was this the Messiah who would merely save them politically? There was divided opinions here too. Now, these two groups of people, they came so close to believing Jesus claims. They, they believed certain aspects of who Jesus was that were true, but they did not believe in him completely. Now, that gives us a portrait of different people these days, doesn't it? Maybe you're part of either of these groups this morning. You recognize Jesus as being a great man. You may come to church because you know that they'll preach Jesus' words and that I can learn from it and my life will be made better if I, if I hear it and do it. Perhaps you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You believe that Jesus did die for your sins, but you only believe in those as mere facts. But yet your life displays that you have not truly followed him. You still do not trust him with your entire life. Now, if this is you today, I invite you to heed the invitation of Jesus and to come to him, to drink from him, to believe in him as Savior and Lord entirely. Now, thirdly, there were those who outright rejected Jesus because of the fact that he was, well, from their understanding, born in the wrong place. He was born they thought in, from Galilee, not Bethlehem, where the scriptures said that the Messiah, the Christ, would be born. Which was interesting because if they had just asked Jesus, Hey Jesus, where were you born? Jesus would have said, Bethlehem. And so they had these preconceived notions as to who this Jesus was. Now Galilee is going to, to get mentioned again later by the religious leaders. And the reason for this and why these people had such... Uh, this reaction towards Jesus and his, his origin, supposed origin, was because there was this intense prejudice against people who lived in the region of Galilee. You know, Galileans were looked down upon. They were, they were seen as unsophisticated. You're not from Judea. It's kind of like, let's imagine an, an imaginary town or a city called the Sutherland Shire, right? Let's just imagine. And... Judea is like the Sutherland Shire, and I'm not, once again, an imaginary town. And any other town outside of Sutherland Shire would be like Galilee. <laughs> That's what they thought. And so they thought that Jesus couldn't be the Messiah. He couldn't be a contender for the title of Messiah because he's not from around here. Now, but I have to ask why. Why the divided opinion? Was Jesus vague about who he was? Was Jesus somewhat unclear about who he was and what his mission was? Was he being fuzzy so that he was able to lead the people astray? I don't think so, because in the last several chapters, if you recall, Jesus had made some audacious claims, claims that made him the most wanted man in all of Judea. In chapter 5, this was after he healed the paralytic man, which really started the whole hostility against him. In John 5, verse 17, in his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. You recall how they responded to that? Jesus was making himself equal with God, and so they tried to kill him all the harder. And then in verse 24 of chapter 5, Jesus says this, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged but has crossed over from death to life. How about in chapter 6, in his bread of life discourse, Jesus says this, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh which I will give for the life of the world. Now these are just... just Certain sayings that Jesus made, and he said more. But if you were to put all these together, what Jesus was saying, what Jesus was claiming was that he is the Son of God. 
that he is from God, that he came down from heaven, that he was eternally existing with the Father in heaven, eternally begotten, not made, not created, that he came down from heaven for the purpose of giving his life for sinners, and that he is the only way to the Father. He is the only way in which a person can have eternal life. So I don't think Jesus was being unclear about who he claimed to to be and what he came to do. I also don't think that it was his invitation to come and drink that caused the division. I mean, who wouldn't want to have their their innermost thirst uh, thirst quenched? For example, I've heard so many different forms of invitations to receive the gospel. Like, do you want to go to heaven? Uh, Do you want eternal life? Do you want your sins forgiven? Do you want an abundant life? Do you want peace with God? And if you were to ask people these questions, more often than not, the answer, of course, is yes, of course. Why would I want an abundant life? Why would I want peace? So what is it that caused division and that causes division until this day? Well, I think what fundamentally caused the division and what continues to cause division is just plain rejection. It's just plain unbelief, rejection of who Jesus claimed to be and what he offered. People did not, people still do not, accept that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. They do not accept that he came down from heaven to give his life for sinners. People do not accept that he is the only way to the Father. You see, if we were to narrow down all the claims of Jesus, what he is offering is the best gift in the world. But the way to obtain this gift is is like a road that is so narrow. It is a road that is exclusive. It is a road that promises difficulties. It is a road that though it offers eternal life, promises a life of trials and tribulation, and as we'll see, division. The question is, are you part of this divided crowd? Have you demoted Jesus to merely a good teacher, a political savior? Or have you even completely disregarded him? Like those people who didn't even bother to ask him if he was born in Bethlehem, even though Jesus was standing right in front of them. Have you completely disregarded Jesus, even though you haven't seriously considered Jesus' words and claims for yourself? Well, let's move on to a division within the religious institution. Verses 44 to 49. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and Pharisees who asked them, why didn't you bring him in? No one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards declared. You mean he has deceived you also? The Pharisees retorted, has any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed in him? No, but this mob that knows nothing of the law, there is a curse on them. You know, back in verse 32, the Pharisees and the chief priests, they deployed these temple guards. And you have to note that these temple guards, they weren't soldiers. They, they aren't like you know, secret service or, you know, these elite soldiers. But these were just employees who worked in the temple, who were sent by the high priests to go and take Jesus. They were given a job to do, and they were just expected to do it. And so what happened? They went, and I find this hilarious, the exact same thing that happened when Jesus was speaking to Jews in verse 15. They were amazed. So they they went to arrest Jesus. Can you imagine that? Soldiers, well, soldiers, the temple guards walking with a mission. They listened to Jesus and they ended up admiring him. And they admired Jesus so much that they left without arresting him. I talk about the the world's most useless police force. I mean, you guys had one job. And and what was their reason? What was their reason for coming back to their bosses empty-handed? Verse 46. No one ever spoke the way this man does. You know, the Gospels make it a point to tell us that there was something different, that there was something distinct 
something authoritative about Jesus and what he taught, the way that he spoke, that both the common person, right, the, the, the most common person, you can call them the unlearned person, to the most learned person, the most religious of teachers, everyone recognized that there was something different about Jesus and what he taught. For example, Jesus, earlier in his ministry, after he preached his Sermon on the Mount, Matthew records this in Matthew chapter 7, verse 28. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority. And here's what's interesting. And not as their teachers of the law. So they recognized that Jesus possessed more than just gravitas, more than just charisma, more than just presence. He possessed otherworldly authority that none of the religious leaders had. But here's the question. If Jesus taught with more authority than their own teachers of the law, if the people, the temple gods, recognized that no one spoke like Jesus and that they were thoroughly impressed by him, they admired him enough to walk back to their bosses empty-handed, then why did they and so many other people continue to follow their own teachers of the law and not Jesus? You see what I'm saying? If Jesus was this spectacular teacher, why would they leave Jesus, not follow him, and go back to the teachers of the law? I don't know if you're familiar with Richard Dawkins, just generally Richard Dawkins. People know about Jordan Peterson. Have you heard about Jordan Peterson? Anyway, so Richard Dawkins is a, an atheist. Right? He's a materialist. There's, there's nothing beyond, this, beyond matter. Jordan Peterson, he's a psychologist. Um, if you if, think about the two most opposite people, you've got Jordan Peterson and you've got Richard Dawkins. And they, had, they went to this podcast and they had an hour and a half conversation and now Jordan Peterson is sympathetic to Christianity. He's not a Christian. He's sympathetic to the ideas of Christianity. He believes it's good. He believes that the, the morals that come from Christianity and the Judeo-Christian framework has helped society prosper. And societies who abandon the, the laws and the morals of found in you know, Judeo-Christianity, societies who abandon that tend to decline so he's sympathetic. He's even, did, he's even done lectures on the Old Testament, and recently I think he's doing lectures on, on the Gospels as well. And early on in the conversation, it went to Christianity because that was the elephant in the room. And people have been trying to squeeze this from Mr. Peterson about Christianity. Are you really a Christian? And I really appreciated what... Um, what Dawkins did, because he pressed him on one of the key tenets of Christianity, the litmus tests of whether you are a Christian or not. He asked Peterson, do you believe in the virgin birth? Do you believe that Jesus was conceived spirit supernaturally? That his origins was not normal, it was not natural. And if you've ever heard Peterson speak, it's this almost incoherent, he, he, verbal kung fu, I call it, to try and dodge himself out of the question. But no, they keep coming back. Even the moderator was saying, you, gotta, you have to at least acknowledge that we're asking a question that requires a yes or no answer. It's not a maybe, it's not a, it could be this, it could be that. But Peterson, though impressed by Jesus, Christianity and the Bible, he admits that he doesn't believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. Here's this man who has taught the Bible. Old Testament, New Testament, runs around with religious people, religious circles. Why do people who come so close to believing in Jesus, impressed by Jesus, and yet go on to follow their own teachers? I think one reason could be is because Jesus and his teaching is going to lead to division. 
not merely divided opinions about who Jesus is, but division between those who hold to who Jesus claimed to be and those who do not. To believe in Jesus means that you are going to believe some supernatural things. To believe in Jesus means you are going to believe what the Bible says. And it means that you are going to reject any idea or philosophy that opposes the teaching of Jesus and, and Scripture. And there are so many ideas, so many philosophies that contradict what the Bible teaches. In Peterson's case, to believe in Jesus and to hold to a belief in a creator, to believe in a supernatural birth of Jesus, that Jesus is the eternal Son of God, and that he was born of a virgin Mary, conceived of the Holy Spirit, would make him the laughingstock of the academic circles in which he inhabits. And almost inevitably, the consequence of following Jesus is rejection, ridicule, ostracization, labeling, becoming a social pariah, a social outcast. I mean, look, look at how the religious leaders respond to the gods. Verse 47 to 49, you mean he has deceived you also? The Pharisees retorted, has any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? No, but this mob that knows nothing of the Lord, there is a curse on them. And you can just smell right, the condescension of these Pharisees. We know what we know. We are the standard. The Pharisees saw the common people as ignorant of the law, which, by the way, Jesus is going to expose the Pharisees, that they were guilty of the same thing, that they were ignorant or even worse, that they were hypocrites because they knew what the law said, but yet they didn't obey it. But the Pharisees saw the common people as ignorant of the law, as feeble-minded, as gullible and easily manipulated. And they say to the temple cards, don't tell us that Jesus got to you too. Don't tell that this Jesus got you good in the same way that he got these feeble-minded mob. This accursed mob. Now, if you choose to follow Christ, there is a high likelihood that there will be people in your life that will think you're crazy, who will think that you're feeble minded and, and gullible and anti science and anti reason, and they'll say things like, No one else believes in that fairy tale stuff. Society, culture, they've come to the conclusion that Jesus is dead as one philosopher has put it. Science doesn't believe in Jesus. Academia doesn't believe in Jesus. Why would you? And these may come from the people you work with. These may come from your professional peers, those outside of your family unit. These are the ones you associate with. It could be a friendship group as well. The Bible tells us that this Jesus will bring division even there. Well, thirdly, we see a division between the religious leaders. Verse 50 to 52. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, asked, Does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he is doing? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? <laughs> Look into it, and you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. And we, we see a progression here, don't we, from the outside to the, the inside from the laity, if you can call that, to now the clergy, inner to outer to inner, and across all categories, Jesus was bringing the vision. Now we're introduced, reintroduced, sorry, to Nicodemus. And you remember Nicodemus back in chapter 3, who, this teacher of the law who visited Jesus by night? Well, he pipes up. Right? If there was ever an unlikely defender of Jesus, it would be Nicodemus, but here we see that there must have been something that changed, that softened his heart after having that conversation with Jesus at night. Because here is this esteemed man, the most reverend, doctor of the law, Nicodemus. He pipes up and he's kind of like a Jesus sympathizer. And I can just imagine how careful he must have been if this, if this ruling group was the Sanhedrin, this group of 70 of the, the elites. Here's Nicodemus, one out of 70, saying something about Jesus. 
defending him in a, in a very wise way, in a way where he's not going to get ousted as being an out-and-out -out follower of Jesus. But here he is, changed in some degree by Jesus. And it prompted him to speak up among a hostile anti-Jesus group. And what does he say? Remember, teacher of the law. As the teacher of the law, the most prominent teacher of the law, he reminds them, the same people who accuse the common people for not knowing the law, that the law requires hearing the testimony from the man accused. But look at how Nicodemus' colleagues reply, verse 52. They replied, are you from Galilee too? Look into it and you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. They, they showed him no respect. Instead, they insulted him. You must be from Galilee too. You must be one of those unsophisticated, unlearned people like those in Galilee. That's the reason why you're defending this man. Huh. In fact, they even outright lied. Because the Bible does not say that no prophets come out of Galilee. In fact, there was Jonah, there was Nahum, there was Hosea, or Hosea Elisha, and Elijah. They all came from Galilee. It's interesting that the sort of division that Jesus brings can find its way even within the ivory towers of religious institutions. These were people who should have known the law. They appealed to the law. They appealed to the scriptures. They should have known it. They should have known it back to front, and they probably did. But yet they missed Jesus entirely. It's interesting that we find the division even within towers of religious institutions, between those who claim to know Christ, who claim to know the scriptures. Now, you'd be surprised at how many theological training centers, seminaries, denominations, who deny the same things that Jordan Peterson denies. They deny that Jesus was born of a virgin. They deny that Jesus is God. They deny that the Bible is the inerrant, the inspired, the infallible, and the authoritative and the sufficient word of God. And they have replaced that primary mission of Jesus to come into the world to save sinners, to die for the sins of the world, to that of purely and primarily, I don't know, social change. Why? Why is there a division even among the religious? Now, one possible answer to that is Possibly because the historic and orthodox teachings of the Bible is too exclusive. It's too divisive, especially in our modern age. We, we need to include as many people in the name of kindness, in the name of unity, in the name of peacekeeping, to avoid division and hostility at all costs, as if division is alien to the Christian faith. You know, in our day, rejection, division, hostility is seen, is seen as a warning that something is wrong. Whereas Jesus says, you've got to expect it. This is part and parcel of the Christian life. In John chapter 16, Jesus says this to, to his disciples after telling them that the world will hate them because the world hated Jesus first. In John 16, he says this, I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. Do you remember what always ticked the religious leaders off? It was when Jesus exposed to them their hypocrisy, their ignorance, and exposed to them the fact that they did not know God, that they did not love God. And Jesus is saying to his disciples, to some degree, you're going to keep preaching that truth. To those people who claim to know God and yet their life shows hatred for the things of God, their lives that shows no mercy, their, love, their lives that shows no grace, and yet it exhibits pride and self-righteousness. You're going to keep preaching to them, and they're going to keep hating you. They're going to keep hating you so much that they're going to, they're going to, they're going to want to throw you out of synagogues and kill you. And they're going to think that it's a good thing. 
Now, don't misunderstand Jesus. He's not saying that his disciples are to be rude. His disciples are not to be obnoxious, arrogant, combative, untactful, or unnecessarily insensitive. Jesus is not saying that we are to incite division for the sake of division as if it's, it's a virtue. Paul reminds Timothy that we are to live a quiet and peaceful life in complete godliness and dignity. Paul reminds Titus in Titus 3.10, warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. So there is a strong warning for those who incite division for the sake of division. No, but rather Jesus is saying this, that as we live out our Christian lives, as we share the gospel, as we preach the gospel, as we share that Jesus is the Son of God and the only way to the Father, only He has the power to forgive sins and to give eternal life. Jesus is saying if you do that, division will come eventually. Why? Because as we do that, we are confronting people with the fact that they need the gospel. Do you remember, how can, you, how can a person take from the water that Jesus offers if they do not recognize that their souls are thirsty? When we share the gospel, we are confronting people with the fact that they, that they have rebelled against God that they are sinners and that they cannot save themselves, that there is no amount of righteous works that they can do to earn their way to heaven, even if they believed in heaven, that they need a righteousness that comes from God, a righteousness that is alien to them, that is outside to them. Jesus tells his brothers earlier in chapter 7 that they can go to the feast without fear of being arrested because the world cannot hate them. But it hates Jesus. Do you remember why? Why the world cannot hate Jesus' brothers, but it hates Jesus? Jesus said, because I testify that its deeds are evil. Now you might think, is that really necessary? Is that, the, is that the best way to, to win friends and influence people? Can we preach the gospel by minimizing or leaving sin out entirely? Well, without sin, without sin, the reality of sin, which by the way, all have sinned. I'm not standing here propping myself up as if I am sinless, nor I'm like the Apostle Paul, I am, I am the foremost of sinners. But can we preach the gospel by minimizing or leaving sin out entirely? Without sin, there's no need for the gospel. Without bad news, the good news is empty. Without the bad news that we have been separated from God, in fact, the greatest division and the greatest peace that we need is the peace from the division that we have with God himself, with our own creator. Are you tempted to remove or lessen the offense or the dividing nature of the gospel? Are you tempted to paint a portrait of Jesus that is murky and muddy, soft and inoffensive in order to not cause division? It happens. It's, it's a temptation, isn't it? It's not a responsibility to take away or to add onto the gospel of Jesus Christ for the sake of inclusion. We don't have a right to modify this sacred deposit that has been entrusted to us. Our responsibility is to keep pointing people that there is a road that leads to eternal life and that road, that way is Jesus. And we can be discouraged that Jesus himself describes that road as narrow, that gate as being narrow. But we have to be encouraged by the fact that though many will not find it, people will find it. There will be people who will turn to Christ. There will be people who will believe in Christ. 
So how are we to live as faithful Christians in a world that is divided about Jesus and are dividing with those who live as Christians and believe in Christ? Well, firstly, remember that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. We must never apologize for it. We must never be ashamed about it. The same message that divides is the same message, listen to this, the same message that brings peace to men. If we are to be truly peacemakers, we are to love our enemies, yes, and live peaceably with men, but the ultimate peace that we can make towards others is the peace that only God can give to them. Romans 5.1 Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, remember that division is part of the Christian experience. If the world hates Jesus, it will hate his disciples as well. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, it says this, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. If you want to live a godly life, if you want to live a life that is in accordance to Scripture, it means you're going to say no to sin. It means you're going to oppose ideas and behaviors and attitudes that the world is saying, yes, this is a good thing. And you're going to say no. I will choose not to believe that. I will choose not to do that because that is not a godly thing to do. To live a godly life means we're going to preach the gospel. We're going to keep sharing the gospel, even to those who hate us. And here's the promise. If you want to live a godly life, you will be persecuted. There will be people who will want to divide from you, and you may even feel it even within the closest units of society, even within your own family. People will be divided about who Jesus is, and if you hold fast to the gospel, people will divide from you as well. Just turn with me very briefly to 1 Peter chapter 4. In verse 12 to 14. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you, you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. You know, as Christians, we get to participate in the exaltation of Christ. We get to be co-heirs with Christ. We get to have God as our Father, Jesus as our brother, and the Spirit indwelling us and helping us live out our Christian lives. We get to participate in that. But just as we are able to participate in our exaltation, in Christ's exaltation, there's also a future exaltation, we must also participate in his sufferings as well. And it is a good thing. What does Peter write here? If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. You are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Back to 2 Timothy 3.14. So if we should expect persecution, expect division, how are we to live? Verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of. If you have learned the gospel, if you have learned the words of God and you're convinced that this is the very words of God... Do not stray from it. Continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of. Sin is still deadly. Everyone has sinned. 
right is still right, wrong is still wrong. But the good news is that the Father, motivated by love, sends his Son, or sent his Son into the world to give his perfect life as a substitute for sinners so that all who recognize their sinfulness upon hearing the gospel might look to Jesus, place their trust in him, receive his grace, and live. People will do that. Despite people dividing from you, despite people being divided about what they believe about who Jesus is, there will be people who will be made right with God. And we get to participate in that mission. Isn't that a blessing? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this example, Lord, of you and your faithfulness to the mission that you came to accomplish. Lord, we are relieved that if the greatest preacher, the greatest prophet, God himself was rejected by men and people were divided over him and his claims, then we too can expect that. Lord, we thank you for the grace that you promise to every believer, that your grace is sufficient to us for every need, for every time of trial that we have. Even, Lord, as we go out and we preach the gospel and we live godly lives and the people may divide from us, there's enough grace there, Lord, to keep us going. Lord, please give us grace to keep the path narrow as you have described it. Help us to be faithful in just calling people to, to repentance and faith, to believe the gospel, to believe that Jesus died according to the scriptures, was buried, and that he rose again according to the scriptures on the third day. Help us to just be faithful in that. Help us to never veer away, even for the sake of unity, even for the sake of inclusion. Lord, I pray if there are people here who are still divided about who you are, that you would please soften their hearts and help them to hear your words. That you came into the world to save sinners. You came to give life, to give health, not for the healthy, but for the sick. You came, Lord, not for the righteous, but for the sinners. Lord, I pray that they would turn from their sin, that they would respond in repentance and faith and believe in you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'll be upstanding. Let's sing our last song.